Good morning, warm greetings to everyone. I am Brooks Barrett, the Minister for Environmental Justice at the United Church of Christ. Glad to have all of you with us. We may be physically locked down, but today we are liberated in spirit as we mark the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I'm excited to have this special edition of Creation Justice webinars. For those of you who are new to us, each month I'm joined by the Reverend Michael Malcolm as we focus on justice with a holistic faith-rooted lens. And Michael, this morning, or this afternoon, I should say, we wouldn't have this lens that I speak of were it not for the Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis Jr. And so what are you thinking and feeling today as we get underway? Michael? Hi, Reverend Dr. Brooks. I am excited. I'm excited. I've got, I'm, I'm actually just a fan of both of our guests today. And so uh, I can't wait to hear what they bring and what nuggets they bring to my life um, and how impactful their conversations will be just the thought of us talking about the earth is the Lord's and, and us getting back to a place, especially in this crisis, of understanding that we are part of the ecosystem and not Lord's over it. It's just amazing to me and, and a great place to have this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin Chavis and Reverend Tracy Black for being with us today. Yes, thank you, Michael. And as Michael indicated today, the duo of Brooks and Michael has become a trio. But uh, don't worry, I won't be singing. I know uh, half the audience right now is saying, thank you, Jesus. Please don't let him sing. But uh, today we are joined by the Reverend Tracy Blackman. I could give Tracy a long introduction as the Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ. She has been a leader on the front lines from Ferguson to Charlottesville, but I will keep it short because she is with us today to introduce our special guest speaker. The game plan for today is that after our speaker presents, we will have time for Q&A and then a closing call to action from Michael. So thank you so much for joining us, Tracy. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Earth Day. I am incredibly excited to introduce to you and to present to most of you, the Reverend Dr. Benjamin Chavis, Jr. Dr. Chavis is a central leader in the launch of the environmental justice movement, going all the way back to the 80s and the 90s. He is the one who coined the phrase environmental racism and played instrumental role in Marion County civil disobedience campaigns, the landmark toxic waste and race report, and the First Nations People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. Today we get to hear from the one who was on the ground and I can't wait to sit at his feet and hear what he has to tell us about this present day. Dr. Chavis currently serves as the president and CEO of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. And the thing I am most proud of is that he is the former executive director for the United Church of Christ Commission on Racial Justice. It is in his footprints that I hope to be able to stand. Without further delay from me, I introduce to you, Reverend Dr. Benjamin Chavis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Leader, the Reverend Tracy Blackman for your kind introduction and for your outstanding leadership across America as the Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Ministries for the United Church of Christ. We're also grateful to the Reverend Dr. Brooks Brent and the Reverend Michael Malcolm for co-hosting today's session. I bring you all greetings from the Southern Conference of the United Church of Christ, which is my home conference of the UCC, headquartered in Burlington, North Carolina. And I bring you all greetings from the National Newspaper Publishers Association, uh, based in Washington, DC, representing the Black Press of America uh, that has been publishing Black-owned newspapers throughout the United States since 1827, for the past 193 years. This is the day that the Lord have made. And we'll call on this 50th anniversary of Earth Day to acknowledge the blessings of life that we've all received from God Almighty, the creator of the world and the creator of the heavens and the earth. 
I am very grateful to the United Church of Christ, the Interfaith Power and Light, and the People's Justice Council for sponsoring today's webinar, Observance of Earth Day. This has been celebrated across the world today. Some would assert that it is both providential and prophetic that at this time in which the vast majority of humanity is now experiencing the devastating impact of the global noble coronavirus pandemic. We are all gathered together, mainly in our homes and sheltered by, uh, at home, sheltered away, but we are connecting via the internet to observe and to participate in Earth Day 2020. We may be socially isolated today, but we are all spiritually motivated. The scripture text for today comes from the Old Testament, where we find in the Psalms of David at the beginning of Psalm 24, as it is written, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. My brief remarks will be focused on the subject, our faith revives, resists, and restores. Our faith revives, resists, and restores. In order to revive humanity, we all have to seek to revive the earth back to its true ec ecological fullness. In order to restore and heal the environment, we have to resist the destruction and the contamination of the air that which we breathe and the water that which we drink and the land that we plant and grow our food. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It is our faith that will enable us to revive, resist, and to restore. The church is a faith community that strives to comprehend and to understand what it means to be a Christian, a committed follower of Jesus Christ throughout one's life journey. Remember the affirmation, the first affirmation in the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the Nicene Creed, similarly, it begins with the faith statement, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, make of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. In truth, Earth Day is actually truly, this day is God's day. Every day is God's day, and therefore every day should be affirmed as Earth Day. 50 years for some is a long time, but for others, it is a relatively short period of time. We recall that on April 22nd, 1970, was the first publicly designated Earth Day. In 1970, as we recall, um, who, was on, who was in the White House in 1970? It was President Richard Milhouse Nixon. He was in the White House. In 1970, 50 years ago, the United States was at the height of the Vietnam War. For many at that time, 1970 was a year of resistance to the injustices of that war's human suffering and environmental damage that was unfolding in Vietnam and throughout Southeast Asia. 50 years ago, it was a time that challenged our faith in God and our understanding of liberation theology. Two years after the tragic assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, the first Earth Day was held here in the United States. We thank God that at the time, at that time, the church ecumenical community stood up and demanded for humanity and demanded a care for the environment as an act of faith. There was a national prayerful longing for revival, resistance, and restoration to protect and love the earth and to protect and love all of humanity. 1970, uh, Dr. Blackman, Reverend Blackman, was also the year that I began my ministry in the United Church of Christ at Oak Level United Church of Christ in Warren County, North Carolina. I was 22 years old after having worked on the staff for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference since the age of 14 as the SCLC Youth Coordinator in my home state of North Carolina. Resisting the evils of racism, oppression, 
and injustice became a vital attribute of my early resume. The following year in 1971, the United Church of Christ sent me to Wilmington, North Carolina to respond to a cry of help from Gregory Congregational Church amidst racial turmoil by those who opposed the desegregation of public schools. Some misguided, arrogant adherents of white supremacy did not want black and white children to go to school together. Time does not permit me today to tell you the whole story about the Wilmington, North Carolina 10. Suffice it to say that I was blessed to be in that group of eight black teenage students and one white woman anti-poverty worker known as the Wilmington 10. In 1972, we were unjustly sentenced to a combined total of 282 years in prison. We were political prisoners for most of the 1970s. By the time our unjust convictions were overturned in 1980 by the Fourth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, citing racial prejudice and prosecutorial misconduct, the last thing that I wanted to do in my life was to get arrested again in my home state of North Carolina. This brings me to one of the best times of my life and ministry. It was in 1982 when the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice again received another call from help, this time from Warren County, North Carolina, where my local church, uh, Oak Level, was located because the governor had decided to dig a hole in the earth and to place in that hole, which he called a landfill in the middle of a black community, some hazardous waste. The governor ordered that 60,000, 60,000 tons of PCB, that cancer causing polychlorinated biphenyls to be dumped in the pit that the state had dug in Warren County. Oh my God, of the 100 counties in North Carolina, why pick the poorest county? Why pick the most predominantly black county to dump tons, 60,000 tons of PCBs? We knew something was very wrong and sinful. I was so proud of the women, men, and children of faith who laid down their bodies on the dusty roads of Warren County to resist and to prevent the trucks that were heavy laden with the PCBs from reaching the dump site. Over 500 faith-filled righteous protesters were arrested. And yes, that was my 63rd arrest. Some of my colleagues in the civil rights movement questioned what did the environment have to do with the struggle for civil rights and racial justice and equality. And there were some in the established pristine environmental movement that question what does the movement for racial justice have to do with protecting and restoring the air, the water, and the land. But as I sat there inside of the Warren County Jail for protesting and resisting the dumping of PCBs into God's earth in the middle of the black community, I realized that there was something more that needed to be said and something more that needed to be defined and articulated as a matter of faith and as a matter of the movement for change or taking responsibility. It was in that jail cell, somewhat like what Dr. King experienced in that Birmingham jail or Dietrich Bonhoeffer experienced in that German prison that I renewed and reaffirmed my faith in the God of creation who created the heavens and the earth. At that moment, it was clear to me that environmental racism was real and that that form of racism needed to be confronted and resisted by both the civil rights movement and the environmental movement. In fact, both movements intersected with the emergence of the environmental justice movement. While I did coin the term environmental racism, the impetus of that definition truly came from the sacrifices and the courageous resistance of those 500 protesters in Warren County who faithfully and effectively challenged the powers of those who had the misguided belief that they had the unlimited authority and eminent domain and dominion over the earth 
and humanity. Today, in 2020, 50 and 40 years later, we're here to still affirm that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Our calling today remains to revive, resist, and restore. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we all have to be reminded of the oneness of God, the oneness of humanity, and the oneness of God's creation. We not only have to be our sisters and our brothers keepers, but also we have to be faithful stewards and protectors of the earth and of the air and of the water that the Lord has made. As the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell would repeatedly affirm, we have to keep the faith, baby. Earth Day is also Liberation Day. Now, I have to be careful, however, because words have different meanings for different folks. When I hear President Trump ask the people in Michigan and Virginia and other states to liberate their respective states, I'm not talking about that kind of pseudo use of the term liberate that has now been used by some right wing politicians that have no regard for the oneness of humanity nor any regard for the oneness of God's creation. The earth does need to be liberated from all the climate change deniers and from all of the polluters who are damaging and destroying the lives of millions of people every day. It is a good sign from the Lord that in the face of all the devastation from COVID-19, people have not lost their faith. The environmental justice movement today is a growing global reality. There are more than a billion people today, right now, around the world, that are affirming the significance and importance of Earth Day, and we join with them in complete solidarity. Thus, and lastly, Earth Day is a sacred day. We are called in part by our statement of faith to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be God's servants in the service of humanity, and to resist the powers of evil. Our Native American sisters and brothers for centuries have tried to get us to see and to affirm the sacredness of Mother Earth. I am, however, optimistic today because of our faith in the living God. Even amidst the contemporary sufferings, preventable deaths, sorrows, pains, anxieties, and worries as a result of COVID-19, there is the very real possibility in the providence of God that we will emerge out of this period of time with a greater sense and a deeper consciousness about the intersections between our faith and human health, global climate, and environmental justice and equity. Reviving and restoring our sense of moral and mutual responsibility to each other without discrimination as to race, color, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, nationality, or geography is a requirement of faith in this day and time. Ontologically, we know and believe that God, our creator, has not stopped creating and has not stopped loving. It is revival time in America and throughout the world. Resisting the powers of evil presupposes the revival of our active faith. There is no greater day or time than right now to speak out audaciously and to stand up fervently and to protect resolutely the sacredness of the earth and the fullness of all of God's creation. Yes, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof.
I close by paraphrasing the words and adding to the words of James Weldon Johnson. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, God of our sacred earth, God of our persistent breath and our precious breath, thou who has brought us into the light, help us, Lord, to continue the fight to protect our environment from those who would cause the world's predicament. Thank you, Lord, for your love and for your care. As we celebrate Earth Day and share with all who affirm your grace and love all over the world, all over the earth and in the heavens above. Thank you so much for listening. This is Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr. Amen. Dr. Chavis, thank you so much for those words that stimulated the mind and lifted the spirits. We are delighted again to have you with us today. We'll now turn towards the Q&A portion of our event. If you have a question for Dr. Chavis, we invite you to type it in by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And we will then read whatever questions we have time to get to this hour. Michael, what's our, our first question that we have lined up for us? Yeah, uh, Dr. Chavis, this question comes from Nathan Holtz. And it asks, where do you see success stories today of interconnecting environmental justice and racial justice? And what are we still struggling with today about that intersection that we need to lift up for growth? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I see the intersection of environment and uh, our faith, as well as uh, the movement for civil rights, for human rights. It's a growing global movement, as I mentioned in my brief remarks. Uh, what started uh, 40 years ago on, on a dusty road in uh, Warren County, North Carolina, is now a global movement, it's an international movement, affirmed by the United Nations. Even the United States Department of Environmental Protection now has an Office of Environmental Justice. We've made impact. Uh, the uh, landmark study that the United Church of Christ did in the late 1980s called Toxic Waste and Race. Uh, now stands as a study that uh, universities and colleges and faith institutions refer to all over the world. So we've had great expansion. So to me, I think sometimes we underestimate how far we've come. Uh, before 50 years ago, uh, there was some focus on the environment, but it was not unified. Uh, thank God for Earth Day. And we need to do it more than just on the 22nd of April. I believe that is a part of our faith that every day that God gives us the breath of life, we should be celebrating the earth, the environment, and the fullness thereof. And that means all of what God has created, not some of what God has created, but what all of what God has created. And that, those are the evidence. When you go outside, you may see a cloudy day or the sun shining, but that's an evidence that our movement, that God is still with us, and, but we have to be active. I think that's, if I understand the question, yes, I do see evidence of the movement growing and expanding. And in the wake last day of the COVID-19 epidemic, Lord knows we need to come back together. Lord knows we need a revival. Lord knows we need to resist uh, the powers of injustice. And Lord knows we need to restore our proper relationship uh, to God's world, to God's environment, and to one another as brothers and sisters. Thank you for that response, Dr. Chavis. There's a question that was in both the chat box and the Q&A that I'll lift up here because I know it's on a lot of people's hearts and minds. Reverend Clara Toomey asks, we know how medical care, uh, with medical care, racism has played an inordinate role in the disproportionate number of people of African descent who are suffering from COVID-19. Can you speak to the effect of environmental racism on the expanse of this pandemic within the African-American community, please? Yes, I'm very pleased uh, to let all of the listeners know that those of us in the National Newspaper Publishers Association, we've established about five weeks ago, a Coronavirus Task Force and Resource Center. 
And one of the things that we found out to answer the question that's posed is that there were these pre-existing conditions uh, for black and brown people, uh, for poor people. Uh, in Harlem today, 60% of the children in Harlem, New York have asthma. They're not born with asthma, but they get asthma as a result of the lack of poor air quality, uh, 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 the lack of good air quality and the existence of poor air quality in Harlem. So these pre-existing conditions like asthma, uh, diabetes, uh, heart condition, obesity, et cetera, uh, make our communities much more vulnerable. But I wanna go back to environmental racism. Um, we all know uh, that, that in the state of Louisiana, there's something called Cancer Alley, where people are disproportionately dying from cancer. Well, guess where the highest rate of the COVID-19 deaths are in Louisiana? Right there in Cancer Alley. Uh, so I think uh, that we have to work harder. Uh, when people talk about going back to the new no uh, old normal, where uh, the new normal will be the old normal, I disagree. I think the old normal was abnormal. And I don't want to return to a new abnormal. I think we have to have a much more uh, vibrant, a much more active. All the faith communities need to come together uh, with all of our organizations. Uh, we tend to splinter into silos. You know, some people on environmental justice, some people on health justice, uh, some people on uh, political justice, some people on economic justice. The, the truth is, all of these matters are interrelated and all these matters intersect with one another. And so we have to have a much more comprehensive view of the movement for change, which is global, and a more comprehensive understanding of our mutual responsibility as persons of faith, as communities of faith, to be active, not just spectators, not just witnesses, but we have to be leaders. We have to be engagers. We have to be mobilizers. We have to be organizers. Then we can celebrate that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Mike, would you have our next question for us? Yeah. Yes, I sure do. Uh, Dr. Chavis, uh, Terry Austin asks, what can we do today to revive, resist, and restore? Uh, thank you very much. That's a great question from Terry. And I, I will try to give a shorter answer. Now, I'm, I'm a preacher. Sometimes I have to preach the answer and not just give the answer. I'm sure some of the clergy know what I'm talking about. Uh, Terry, I think that um, first, having the data. You, you hear a lot of our health professionals say that a lot of states are not uh, collecting the data. Uh, of the disproportionate impact on black and brown communities across the country. Uh, so part of resisting, we have to know what to resist and that is collect the data. So that's very important. Number two, I think in um, trying to uh, revive, uh, uh, not just the sense of the economy, there's this rush now to revive the economy, which I think is important, but you're gonna injure more people if you try to revive the economy too soon. And that's what I see happening. I, I'm just, it's shameful what uh, the state of South Carolina is doing. It's shameful what the state of Georgia is doing. It's shameful what the state of Tennessee is doing by telling people to go to the beaches, to go to barbershops, go to beauty parlors. That puts people at risk. So part of a revival um, is what we're having right here is not only having these discussions, but finding ways and means that we can not only issue the warnings to people, issue the directives to people to protect themselves, continue to wash your hands, wear the masks, wear the gloves, uh, the PPEs. But I will add something else to having PPEs, and that is having prayer, 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 PPP. We need to pray. Uh, and we need to uh, not only pray for our own families, and uh, loved ones, but our, all of our families and loved ones. And then lastly, restore. Uh, Terry, I believe that uh, restoration is not an individual uh, thing alone. Restoration takes place in the community of faith. Restoration takes place in our communities. Uh, I know you live there in Harlem. 
I'm very concerned about the community of Harlem as all of our communities uh, need to be restored uh, to the sense of having more control over the things that impact uh, the quality of life in our communities, whether in the Northeast and the Southeast, on the West Coast, the Midwest. Uh, really pray for our brothers and sisters right now, not only in New York, but in Detroit, uh, all the major hotspots in, in Milwaukee and Chicago and uh, in St. Louis, uh, uh, as well as uh, down south. And I know a lot of our publishers in Florida. Uh, I was so sad uh, to hear about the young sister, five years old, who passed away. Her parents, one was a police officer and one was a, a healthcare worker and their daughter contracted the virus and, and passed away uh, out of their service. So I would ask all of us today to keep our frontline healthcare workers in our prayers, uh, in our support. I think there's gotta be a much more effort. I know Congress just passed another stimulus bill. Uh, I'm very concerned about the distribution of those resources because what, what has happened in the past stimulus bills, uh, the rich got more rich the poor got more poor. And I'm very concerned that the distribution of uh, the resources, even in this environment of COVID-19, still experiences racial discrimination and those who would deny access of health and help from those who are the most need. Well, we have to do unto the least of these if we wanna have full restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chavis for that response. We are honored today to have a number of long distance runners in the struggle for justice as part of our audience. Uh, I'm seeing that some of those names pop up here in the Q&A. Uh, we've got Bernice Powell Jackson and we've got Peter Sawtell and another of other people who have joined with us today. Terrific to have them join us. Peter Sawtell, long distance runner for justice asks this uh, question. He says, Dr. Chavis, your wonderful phrase, our faith revives, resists, and restores, makes me think of a theme from the World Council of Churches, Jesus Christ liberates, divides, and unites. Too often the church is afraid to resist and divide for a holy cause. Can you speak to the prophetic and in-your-face role of the church? Well, thank you very much for that question, and thank you for being a long-distance runner. Uh, I can't wait to hear from Bernice Powell also. She's one of my colleagues from the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, let's deal with this term prophetic. Some people think prophetic means foretelling the future, but actually prophetic means what does God, what is God saying to us now, today? What is God saying to us in the church? What is God saying to us in the community? What is God saying to all those frontline healthcare workers that are uh, exposing themselves to danger to try to save human life? And what is it saying to those of us who are sheltered in our homes right now because of the COVID-19? I think the prophetic thing is not only to hear what God is saying, but to act on it. And this is where resistance comes. We have to resist the powers of evil in real time. You cannot procrastinate when it comes to resist an evil. You cannot put it off to when you're comfortable. You cannot put it off to when it's uh, preferable. But when you sense that evil is taking hold, that evil is uh, uh, being uh, 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 camouflaged, it's our right and responsibility as part of this, as we say in North Carolina, we pull the sheets off of things. Sometimes you have to pull the sheets off the Klan. Sometimes you have to pull the sheets off the clandestine uh, activities of those that would do harm uh, to the poor and to the least of these. So yes, resistance is a vital part of our statement of faith. It's a vital part of who we are as a people, a faith community. And Jesus, as you know, uh, commanded all of his followers uh, to follow the righteous path and not to try to seek that which is uh, the wide path, sometimes the narrow path, which causes resistance, is the best path. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Chavis. Uh, since uh, Reverend Brooks brought up uh, Bernice Powell Jackson, let me go ahead and ask you the question. First, she said, thank you for your leadership. And he, she also commented, you didn't just 
coined the term environmental justice or environmental racism, you helped create a movement across racial lines, graphic line, uh, geographic lines, income lines. Here's the question. What can we do to help grow that movement across those lines? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, the Reverend Bernice uh, Powell, and thank you for your ministry and for your long distance running. Um, certainly, uh, I, I mentioned about the silos. I think too often our movement is splintered. It should be much more unified. And I think that um, one of the things I've, I've studied is the importance of having interdisciplinary discussions, interdisciplinary planning, uh, interdisciplinary action, where we work together uh, across our fields of endeavor, across of our fields of expertise. I, I think that we can learn a lot uh, from people's movements. Uh, when I see uh, people in these communities now that have been devastated uh, by COVID-19, uh, one of the things that the news media is not uh, uh, doing a lot to report, except for the Black press, we're reporting on it, is that there's a real grassroots movement now going, or people can for one another. People can for the people in their communities. People going knocking on doors, making sure that the elders are okay. Uh, people buying food, not just for themselves, but for their neighbors. A sense of community is being revived. A sense of community is being restored. And I just pray to God, uh, Bernice, that we hold on to these things and not let them subside. And we go back to what I refer to as the prior abnormal. We need uh, a new way of life that uh, celebrates our togetherness, that celebrates our diversity, that celebrates our inclusion. Most of corporate America today is facing challenges because of the lack of inclusion and diversity. And I think the church, we need to raise our voice about this uh, because to the extent to which we don't have a fully representative movement for, to protect the environment, uh, to, to engage in environmental justice is the extent to which it will uh, prolong our winning the victories that we need to win. And we have won some victories and we've suffered some defeats. Uh, look what's happening right now in 2020. The census is being counted. Uh, I thought it was shameful what happened in Wisconsin where they made people go vote amidst the hype of the pandemic. And some people contacted uh, the uh, coronavirus because they were trying to exercise their right to vote, which is a precious right to vote. So the church, I think, has to raise its voice. We have to amplify our, uh, not just observance of what's going on, but we need to amplify our uh, offering uh, a way and a methodology that is an interdisciplinary methodology, interdisciplinary gathering of all of the various gifts and talents. Uh, lastly, I just, uh, um, Bernie's question reminds me that I want to share, uh, listen, God gives everybody gifts and talents, you know? Uh, and I think uh, part of what we are facing today is the arrogance uh, of some who think that they, they're only intelligent, they have their only intelligence, that they have their only genius, they have their only vision. No, I think the fullness thereof means that God has spread out his blessings to everybody and we should start embracing everybody. And now in this global pandemic, I believe, uh, uh, dear uh, colleagues, that we need to have much more uh, interface with one another internationally and globally, multilingual, uh, multicultural, uh, where we find uh, those common uh, denominators among us that brings us together and keeps us together. Thank you so much for the question. And thank you for that response. Up next, we have a... Uh statement and a question from someone who, if I understand correctly, is possibly a former classmate of yours, okay. uh, Robert Lewis Shepard. He says, the faith community is more silent today than when we came along in the 60s. What would you say to those of faith who feel helpless today more than ever? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Brother Shepard. Uh, God bless you, and thank you for all the work that you've done over these years. Um, I, I do believe that the church needs to amplify its voice. Uh, I, I don't think that the church should uh, wait uh, for the political leaders. 
Uh, I don't think the church should wait uh, for the economic leaders. Uh, thus saith the Lord. I think we have something to say uh, to all of the other leadership, not to, uh, in terms of just condemnation, but in terms of offering a vision of the oneness of humanity, the oneness of God and the oneness of creation. Things are too divisive right now. And I think that um, uh, some nations are trying to build walls. Well, we should not only be trying to dismantle walls, we should be trying to create much more wholeness uh, within the human family. So I do believe, uh, I agree uh, that we have room to grow. I, I, I just really, I'm so proud of my uh, denomination, United Church of Christ, uh, does work ecumenically and does work interfaith. Uh, because it's just not about one faith. It's about all of our faiths working together toward that end of uh, preserving what the Lord has given us in creation. And so I think that, yes, we all need to raise our voice, not to point fingers at one another, but to open hands and open arms and to embrace one another and work together and get the job done. Dr. Chavis, uh, Alvin, um, Compon asked the question. First, he said, thank you for reclaiming the real meaning of liberation and the real meaning of the Lord's day as Earth Day. Then he asked the question, can you comment on the tremendous opportunities available through wind and solar power to displace carbon polluting energy generation? How do people of faith best give expression to this biblical idea of creation care? Well, well, thank you. That's, uh, thank you so much for the question. Certainly, uh, we should be involved in the innovations uh, that are taking place in the energy sector. Uh, isn't it ironic that on this day, uh, the major oil companies have to pay people to take their oil because the price of oil is below a dollar a barrel. Uh, it was already overpriced. And I think that moving from an oil-based economy uh, to innovative sources of energy is a part of what I meant by restoration. It's a part of what I meant by revival. And I think sometimes we have to resist the temptations uh, to do what we think is easy. I do think that solar power, uh, wind power, uh, but also I would say human power. Uh, we need to uh, look at ourselves much more innovatively and much more creatively. Uh, we are using now uh, the internet to do this webinar. webinar. We're communicating uh, via um, a digital and electronic means of communication. Most of the national events that we're going to be planned uh, this summer are now going to have to have virtual conferences. So we are adjusting to these realities. But I think this is an opportunity uh, to the uh, uh, questioner that uh, certainly solar power, certainly um, wind uh, power, and other forms of energy, uh, renewable energy, ought to be definitely focused on. And But we also have to encourage uh, many more of our young people to engage in science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as the social sciences. Uh, we need to uh, look at, I'm so proud, and most people don't talk about it, that even during the uh, COVID-19 uh, battle, the lead scientists, the lead scientists at the NIH as a system uh, you know, uh, who is uh, working on uh, the vaccine uh, and has been working on it for years. So thank you. Uh, I think that we have to work and innovate and continue to use solar and uh, wind power, but all of the innovations uh, that are taking place in science, uh, in technology, but also I think the faith community should weigh in to make sure that these new forms of energy are in keeping with our faith and in keeping with what we understand of protecting and restoring the earth. All right. Thank you for that response. We have a question here from Hans Holsnagel. Dr. Chavis, from what you have learned in your work with hip hop artists and with other young people, do you have suggestions about how to support young activists in their efforts for environmental justice? Oh, yes. Thank you, Hans. Uh, another great question. Yes. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I just did a um, webinar uh, live stream with Chuck D of the famous uh, Public Enemy uh, hip hop group. And of course, our hip hop artists, male and female, I'm so pleased what Alicia Keys is doing. She's 
uh, issued a new song and raising uh, money for the healthcare workers, uh, uh, which is going to be broadcast nationally, uh, I think, uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, so yes, we should engage our hip hop artists. And I know uh, this is an area where I, I probably faced a little criticism about 20 or 30 years ago because I reached out to hip hop artists and a lot of people thought, well, hip hop is uh, profane, hip hop is uh, using terrible language. And I reminded all of the critics at that time, well, if you want our young people uh, to use language in the absence of profane words, then help us change the social and economic and environmental conditions, those profane conditions that people have to live that their artists words and poetry and lyrics portray. In other words, we have to use our culture, our music, our poetry, our sermons, everything that we do, not only to shed light on where there's an injustice or shed light where there's an opportunity to, to do better, but to celebrate the gift of poetry, the gift of lyrics, the gift, the gift of music as a way to activate and motivate people uh, to change the world. So yes, uh, uh, Hans, we do work with our hip hop artists and our soul, our R&B artists, our jazz artists, you know, our blues artists, all the different genres, our, our country and Western uh, singers as well. I, I think in all of the genres of music, you can find those um, activists, you can find those lyricists, those videographers that would want to weigh in to help make the world in which we live a better place. Amen. Uh, Dr. Chavis, uh, Adriana Langston asked, Dr. Ch Dr. Reverend Chavis, is there a path towards environmental restoration that does not include dismantling capitalism as it is practiced in the United States? slash the West today. Seems to me capitalism rewards putting profit over people and over sustainability. Uh, yes, I, I think that um, there should be a critique of capitalism, but also I think there should be a critique of socialism. I think there should be a critique of all isms uh, that purport uh, to give uh, all of humanity the only path way forward. I do not think that uh, one economic system versus another economic system is going to totally solve uh, the world's problems or America's problems. I, I do think that uh, it's a good uh, discussion that we should have. My only caution is I think that when we try to find an ideological solution uh, to a theological problem, I think sometimes we wind up uh, giving uh, uh, an answer or a solution that doesn't hold uh, for the whole of humanity. And that's why I think that Earth Day is so important because it pauses us, no matter what discipline we may come from, uh, to look at our environment, to look at the air we breathe, to look at the water we drink, the food we digest, and how, what is our interaction with the environment? You know, what, what care do we take uh, with uh, the world uh, outside of our own uh, presence. And I, I think so we're, uh, because of the technology now, we're a much more global community. But in fact, we are not, we have not reached the stage yet where we care about one another on a global sense. Uh, people are backing off from the United Nations. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a major thing. But uh, is it practice? Not as much as it should be. So yes, I think that the critique of uh, capitalism is uh, on time, but I would not uh, say that that critique alone is gonna provide all of the answers that all of humanity needs. Right. Thank you, Dr. Chavis. Uh, your uh, sermonette responses have been just the right length and where they are appreciated. Hopefully we can squeeze in one or two more sermonette responses. Thank you. Uh, got a, a couple of questions here that focus on uh, hope and uh, how we are become resilient in this moment. I'll pick out one here. Jim Castroling says, we live in overwhelming times. Environmental justice with the intersectionality of justice issues is correct but overwhelming. How do we focus our efforts so as not to be overwhelmed? I can't tackle the whole thing at once. 
Well, thank you. Uh, to me, the antidote to being overwhelmed is to be underwhelmed. What I mean by that is we have to start at a very small grassroots level. Um, mass movements evolve, but they also evolve from a very small group. Remember the Warren County uh, example. We started out with a, a few less than 50 people. It grew to 500. Now there are hundreds of millions of people involved in environmental justice. It takes time. Change also uh, to the question does not happen overnight. It takes time. So uh, don't be worried. Keep your faith strong. We shall overcome. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Chavis. Last question for you, Dr. Chavis, comes from Jessica Hansen. What advice would you give to someone who wants to start mobilizing his or her church to actively engage with environmental stewardship of God's creation? Where would you start? Well, in the local church setting, I, I would start uh, first with the pastor of the church, as well as a, a committee in the church uh, that to work on environmental justice issues. Uh, one of the things that uh, is not uh, highlighted enough uh, by our churches is all the good work that the churches are doing in our communities of service. So to me, environmental justice uh, can cross uh, some of the existing structures you already may have in your local church. But if you don't have a structure that affirms and it pays attention uh, in a consistent way to environmental justice, I would say start it there. And then though, you need other churches. I would not put the burden of environmental justice on one local congregation. Uh, then you will be overwhelmed. You need a network, you need a community of faith uh, um, uh, coming together, uh, faith entities, faith churches. Uh, and also I would say not only cross denominational lines but cross ecumenical lines and cross interfaith lines. Uh, keep in mind, uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that's for all people. Uh, those who believe and those who don't believe, they still are uh, created by our Lord and Savior. And so let us work together and let us uh, make progress together. But the local church is a good place to start. Thank you for that, Dr. Chavis. Um, it sounds as if though you're, you're saying one of our first steps that we need to take is to actually start speaking with each other. That's correct. Communication yeah. is very important. Like I said, we can be socially isolated, but we have to be spiritually motivated to be in touch with one another. I, I would even say we can be physically isolated while still being social socially together. That's correct. And as you have pointed out, there are too many uh, avenues that we can actually use that we can still be connected because of technology. So our physical distancing right now does not mean that we have to be socially distant. We can still be connected and we can still work. In fact, at this present moment and in this present time, they are still working. The EPA is being rolled back. Uh, NEPA has been, has been um, attacked and is, is on its last leg if it's not already defunct. Uh, we have the immigration issue that we have a temporary ban on all immigration as if though immigrants are to blame for the ineptness um, and, and ill preparedness of our administration and governmental leaders. I, I think that now is the time that we aren't to be silent and, and allow for uh, this for us to be, to use being uh, distant from one another physically to stop us from working. To get even busier now because we are actively seeing the injustices and the disparities, not only in uh, communities of color, but throughout. And in particular in communities of color and those that we often serve um, who are of, of lower economical standing are really feeling the effect of this. So now is the time for us to answer our prophetic call and to uh, speak truth in power and to speak truth in love 
And even more so, now is the time for us to forge a way of reshaping community and what that looks like. Because we're seeing that it's gonna take all of us looking out for all of us in order for us to survive. COVID has pointed out to us, if nothing else, that we absolutely need to be in community with one another. There is none that we can leave out when we look at the earth as the Lord's. As I've said before, and I'll say again, the earth is the Lord says that it's God's or it's the Lord's earth. We are simply a part of the ecosystem. We are not to be Lord's over it. And so if we are a part of the ecosystem and if we are to care for our fellow uh, uh, mankind, fellow humankind, fellow nature, nature, fellow life, then we've got to do this thing together and it's gonna take all of us. So that's my call to action. My call to action is echoing the words of Dr. Chavis. Start communicating with one another first. Form some relationships inside your circles and outside your circles first. And then let's all attack together. But the time to do that is now. Thank you. This has been my call to action. Thank you, Michael, for that call to action. And thank you, Dr. Chavis, for uh, thank you. Uh, what I hope is a ripple effect today that we will leave this webinar and this time together and ripple outward for the sacred cause of justice. And so we are deeply appreciative, Dr. Chavis, of, of your words and your wisdom as we have gathered here today. Thank you so much. Uh, you are a blessing to the church and to the world. Thank you, God bless. Yes, thank you. Next month, Michael and I will be back with another webinar entitled Answering the Call, Environmental Justice is Health Justice. And so we welcome you all back. Well, there'll be a recording of this, uh, this event that I will email out to people, it'll be on YouTube and any links or resources that have been mentioned, I'll put into that email as well. We are grateful to everybody who has joined with us today. Thank you so much. and. Have a wonderful Earth Day. God bless.